Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. And today, we are going to ferret out the important dynamics around choosing a life partner. Wow. <laughs> I mean, this is this is such a big topic that a lot of yes. people bring into an analytic space. Big topic and big process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the repercussions for, for making a poor choice or uh, an unconscious choice yeah. is enormous. You know, it really is. I, th I think about that sometimes when you think about sort of decisions you can make in your life that will really impact how you, <laughs> what it looks like. And boy, this is a big one, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's huge. And the repercussions can be really life altering and knock people off a good life path, especially if there are children, um, all, all kinds of things. It's the, probably the one of the biggest decisions if not the biggest decision anyone ever really makes in life. And you see the other side of it too, where someone comes in, you know, maybe having made that decision and then rethinking it. And is it is it right to make a change? Is it right to to dissolve the partnership? You know, they're sort of wondering if wondering if it's possible to kind of do better, if you will. You know? Yes. So that pivotal place that people will often come into our office which is when the spirit of the marriage seems to have left. Mm -hmm. And what happens when it doesn't return? Or what can we do or they do to bring the spirit of the marriage mm -hmm. back to life, back into the relationship? Right. But even just sort of beginning, sort of at the beginning, do you have people come in who are in a relationship maybe and contemplating a next step in terms of commitment and wondering, is this the right person? You know, once again, interestingly enough, I hear that dynamism much more in young men than I do in young mm -hmm, women mm -hmm. at this point. That young men feeling that it's their responsibility to make the declaration that this is going to be a sustained marital or marriage-like mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. and weighing what criteria inside of them should they pay the greatest priority to. Mm -hmm. For instance, a young man might feel a tremendous amount of ardor Mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of sexual compatibility, but then have a lot of other questions mm -hmm. about, particularly, will that sustain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's hard for Is a, that how they articulate it? They do. It'll show up perhaps in more um, colloquial language of, you know, will I want to be sexual with this person mm -hmm. for 20 years? Mm-hmm. And hmm. will I will I be able to respond mm -hmm. sexually to a person for twenty years? Mm -hmm. I do think that young people are more attuned than perhaps in the past to how painful and problematic it is to dissolve a long term relationship, mm -hmm. so that they do feel cautious mm -hmm. about it. I see less impulsive jumping mm -hmm. in to moving in together or jumping into the legal arrangement of getting married. So part of the work seems to be sorting out, in our work, which ideas and which images seem to hold the most, most potency in their mind. And we'll actually often do a Venn diagram hmm. as part of their work, actually diagram it out and then <laughs> pull out from that how it is that those ideas became such a priority for them. Not to depotentiate it, but just to understand it. So you're saying kind of diagram out what their priorities are in looking for a partner? In looking for a partner, but that's often stimulated by the fact that they think they found a partner. Yeah, of course. Like that's when the question arises and with some degree of urgency. Right. Is, uh. So it, uh, I'm hearing here that there's this ardor issue for, for men. So maybe there are different issues for women at an emotional level. But then there's also the, with the Venn diagram idea, of the idea of what are the practicalities of a committed lifelong partnership, of how do I feel about money and intellectual companionship and children and 
you know, a hundred other things probably, depending on the person. And I think of that, uh, and mostly it comes up for me in my practice with women, as what I call the business of marriage. Mm -hmm. And I'm using marriage as an umbrella term for a committed partnership. Of what are the practicalities mm -hmm. you will face, uh, depending upon what your goals are and what your prospective partner's goals are? Mm -hmm. Well, I absolutely think about the practicalities, and it reminds me of uh, the pre cana work that mm -hmm. the Catholic Church will do to ask these important um, logistic questions about it. But when I think about mapping out or helping a client map out their fantasy or their drive to get married, we are dealing often with very soulful questions. So you say you love this person. How do you define love? Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Who taught you that? That when you go back and you think about your first uh, moment of clarity around romantic love, how did that happen? So I find that that is a question that comes up a lot when people are grappling with, is this, you know, is this the right relationship to become a long-term partner? Is sort of what is love? Do I love this person? Am I in love with this person? I don't know. I don't really know what that means. Just there's this tremendous lack of clarity around it. And I think that there's a kind of cultural mythology about love. And it goes something like this, like, you will just know <laughs> that there will be this almost sort of revelation kind of experience. And I'm not denying that that happens for some people. I think it does. But I just think that there's a wide variation of sort of responses that can be adaptive, that, that can work, you know? And, you know, one, one of the things is if you don't have this sort of revelatory experience where you're just sort of swept off your feet and you just can't imagine anything else, it can be confusing because you, you, you sort of think, well, if that's not there then this must not be right. I remember having this conversation with someone where she was engaged to someone and she was as sure as one is. But she she said to me, this was a friend, she said, you know, but but I, I met someone the other day and he was he makes more money than Mike and he was better looking than Mike. And how do I know that, you know, sort of Mike is kind of as good as it gets in a way. And I found myself saying, well, you don't. And that's why it's called a commitment. Mm. You know, that in some sense, there's, there's a point where you, you make a commitment and it isn't provisional on that. It's as good as you can, you can do. You know, it, it's, it's not like shopping. No. Is this really my best buy? Right. You know, there's a, a book that I love called The Magus by John Fowles. And there's this great line in it where, you know, it's like boy meets girl. And then there's this whole long novel where they're not together. And then they find each other again at the end of the book. And he says to her, is there someone else? And she says, there's always someone else if you're looking. Mm -hmm. So at mm -hmm. some point, this is terribly unromantic. Mm -hmm. At some point when you decide to create a long-term partnership with someone, you are saying, I'm going to stop looking. And continue to invest and reinvest in the relationship, in the idea of the relationship, and in the system around the relationship that supports it. Mm -hmm. And that that's where the life force goes. Yes. Rather than this relationship keeps reflecting back to me anew each day, mm -hmm. that this is really fabulous and there's no doubt ever that this is the very best thing. So what we're, I think, maybe pointing to is a level of maturity uh, that can go beyond the, the romantic sort of chemistry, attraction, sexuality, all the rest of it, a readiness to make the commitment to partner with someone and that there is a business aspect to that. I'm using business loosely, but that now we're going to be partners. We're going to go through life together. We're going to work together to, to keep on finding each other and refinding each other as we go along. Each of us is ready to really be responsible to ourselves and to the relationship. So no, I'm not going to look because any further than this because I don't need to be filled up with, you know, passionate feelings all the time. 
I'm ready to give something mm -hmm. as well as to receive the riches of a partnership, but it's much more grounded. Mm -hmm. You know, you use that term business, and I don't believe that this is uh, original to me. I think I heard someone else say this, but I think it's really good. And I will share this sometimes with people who are at this point. I will say, if you had some savings, if you had a million dollars in the bank or 200,000 in the bank, and that was it, that was your, you know, that's what you got. Would you go, would you create a business with this person and sink every last dime that you have into the business with this person? And that can be really clarifying because that's, that's essentially what you're doing when you get married is you are absolutely very closely knitting together your, you know, financial future with the person. And this is true to a certain extent, even if you don't formally get married, although there's different vulnerabilities with the legality of, of a marriage. And, uh, you know, if you can't trust that person to absolutely make the best decision with, you know, your beloved pet, with your future child, with your money, then, man, that's not good. Trust is the foundation, I think, and I think that's exactly it. Do I trust you with, you know, all of the resources, uh, external and internal, to honor this relationship and hold your end up? Mm -hmm. That the two of us are going to be uh, hitched together, and they call it, used to call it getting hitched, but we will be pulling that wonderful wagon called life, and maybe it will be filled with adventures and children and pets and responsibilities and goals and values, but uh, we're going to be doing this together. And can I trust you? And trust your judgment. Your judgment and your maturity. Mm -hmm. So the image that, that's being evoked in my mind as I'm listening is that everybody would want to date and marry a CPA. <laughs> well, the, the good, good, good point. Which, uh, Gee, which maybe be, that's true in the world as well. It used to be a doctor, well. but I guess today it'll be a CPA. <laughs> um, but in addition to those um, competencies yeah, out yeah. in the world, I think there's that wonderful idea that Jung talked about, that when two people come together in an intimate way, that it's akin to a chemical reaction that can't really be predicted. Mm -hmm. So that when people are deeply open to each other, their unconscious union produces responses and reactions which they cannot control mm -hmm. uh, and which have to be honored and validated and explored mm -hmm. as the basis upon which they then decide does this evoke from me a state of being mm -hmm. that I would want to invest in, that I would want to have all the time? Mm -hmm. And then the second level is once that's established, you know, is this sustainable in the real world with all of the real world responsibilities that that, you know, brings forward? So you're talking about the unconscious attraction or the unconscious level of relationship and how people often will choose somebody who manifests characteristics, strengths that one doesn't have. Uh, so the or old, doesn't have a conscious relationship. With, exactly. Yeah. And that with this person who models and lives out something that is in the other person's shadow, the hope is that those two people reciprocally will help each other develop what's in their shadow. Therefore, the perhaps very shy person who partners with a very extroverted person, the shy person will in time hopefully have more access to his or her extroversion. And so it goes. And that what are the qualities that help people, two people, develop one another uh, versus conflict and destructiveness? Well, I think that that's a very positive and perhaps idealized view of it, but I also see people coming together and the unconscious dynamic evokes a kind of ferocity in them, which is deeply enlivening to them, which is mysterious to the people around them, mm -hmm. but which they feel compelled to continue to, to stay involved with. Now, I'm not talking about a, a relationship where people are overtly injuring each other, but wouldn't be as logical or as... Mm -hmm. Uh, even knowable as the idea of simply compensating inferior or well-developed mm -hmm. traits 
And the three areas that I often will ask, particularly young men, because I think this is an area that is less verbalized in masculine psychology and it's more, has much more language in the culture of women because it's talked about it more, is that I ask the young men to differentiate between eros, sex, and love. And to be able to have, not that there aren't other differentiations, but that at least those three primary differentiations are something that they've thought through. So around eros, which I think is a drive towards passion, and that when eros is being uh, stimulated in the relationship, both partners feel deeply enlivened, deeply psychologically enlivened, but that eros can also enliven a young man in relationship to his career or in relationship to nature or any other environments, but that the spouse might be able to do that. Sex is different in as much as the sexual drive is seeking a certain kind of rise of sexual tension that leads to the rapid release of the tension and orgasm and a form of physical relaxation at the end of it on the most basic level. And that love I think is a drive for union and that when love is achieved, it actually leads to a state of deep peace. Hmm. And those are very different targets. Now, I don't know if many of us are blessed to have a relationship that provides all of that, but when that does, then people's socks are knocked off. But I think when people are trying to understand why am I pursuing this person, that those differentiations help them at least understand what the drivers hmm. are, but also to be able to, to look at what's missing. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the drive for sexual excitation and release is so powerful in a 20 year old <laughs> that the issue of love or the desire for union or even a kind of psychological enlightenment isn't even on the map. And that that could put the relationship at risk 20 years down the line <laughs> if that isn't discovered. Well, I, I'm sitting here kind of smiling. Uh, in my practice, there are a lot of young women uh, in their, often in their 30s, who are now starting to really think about finding a life partner. And I'm back on your uh, facetious comment about everyone is looking for a CPA. Well, of course they aren't. But I do think that maybe there's an interesting uh, little secret here. Women are much more practical than that, especially if children are in their life dream of that this the woman is the one who will bear the child and still today have a very major part of physiologically birthing and breastfeeding and bonding, etc. I think women are much are quite practical about whether this is going to work in the external world on a daily task-oriented level. And will we have a stable home? Will we have stable income? Can I really trust you to shelter and protect that uh, while we are raising children, even if both people work outside the home? And interestingly, I rarely hear men verbalize that as a primary agenda, that I think men are often driven by the desire to be enlivened in one way or another, enlivened sexually, enlivened in terms of psychological hmm. uh, eros enlivenment. So, and sometimes if they're more mature, they can admit there is a drive to have an experience of peace and comfort. That often doesn't happen till, till the man is much more mature in his thinking. So uh, now it's all of a sudden like a podcast for men are from Mars and women are from <laughs> Venus. But, but I think that's fair because we are talking about archetypal patterns. You know, I just, I heard Deb also referencing 30s and I heard you referencing 20s and I wonder if that's part of it too. I mean, mm -hmm. I definitely have some, you know, I, I have seen women in their 20s be a little swept up in in what I think you're describing as Eros, Joseph, you know, sort of really lamenting the fact that the very stable person that they're in a relationship with isn't, that the connection doesn't feel as charged, maybe. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel enlivening. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't it sort of safe. have the pixie dust mm -hmm. kind of quality to it. And some of them have a belief that that is necessary 
for a long-term happy relationship. And in fact, they think it also needs to be there always, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, that's where I, I sort of, you know, squint my eyes and turn my head to the side and say, what? (laughs) Yes. We're not machines. (laughs) So we can't be that predictable. Right. Well, and also I think, I think that everyone should have one of those relationships where you stare into the other person's eyes and, you know, time stands still and, you know, all of that. That's amazing. It's that, that, that really, that really intense experience of Eros. And I am not at all convinced that that's the right relationship in which to have children, if that's in your life dreams. Or if that's all that's there. Yes, yes. So that's a component, but other things would need to be there to imagine, uh, you know, a future for 40 years with somebody. Yes, and if you have one of those relationships where you stare into each other's eyes and the, you know, the planet ceases moving or whatever, I guarantee you that won't be happening when you've got a 2-year-old and a 4-year-old. Right. You'll you'll be sort of snarling at each other through uh, alternating loops of guilt and resentment and, you know, whose turn is it to empty the dishwasher? And that will be fine too. You know, like a night, a, a night together will be like, oh, great, let's fold laundry, you know, and that's part of it. I mean, I think some people think, oh, that would be so disappointing. But in some sense, that's, you know, it's sort of the transcendent quality of the ordinary, if you will. And, and I think that's a way of uh, trying to attract a certain amount of life force to the domestic images. Mm -hmm. But I think in investigating the topic with our clients, we do need to tease out as much as we can, and dreams can sometimes point to it, Mm -hmm. what kinds of images are lighting up inside of you that are even guiding this topic coming Mm -hmm. up? Are they exclusively idealized romantic images? Mm -hmm. And I've certainly worked with clients that that had numinous domestic images Hmm. that actually coming home and having dinner with a spouse every night is full of life force. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to find out what's cooking (laughs) in the background. So to speak. Not to disrespect it, but just to make sure that... Just to make it more conscious. It's in form that way. Making things more conscious. I like your phrase, Lisa, a lot about... The transcendence of the ordinary Mm -hmm. and uh, the acceptance of the ordinary. And it can uh, have its own special qualities of enlivenment and security and love and comfort Mm -hmm. together with one person. But the pixie dust stage is going to end. And Mm -hmm. from time to time, it may come back. But I think we are talking about the transcendence of the ordinary and someone who, when you come home and say that uh, the grocery store didn't have a certain brand and the store manager was snippy, someone who's going to listen to that and who's (laughs) going to care Mm -hmm. and reflect your feelings of frustration. Absolutely. (laughs) And and coming back, just a few uh, summary ideas that the pixie dust uh, stage uh, in experimental psychology is called the limerence stage. Mm. And the research, and there's been a lot of research on it, says that it takes six months to two years for the average person to transition out of the idealization stage. So, you know, always at the risk of being directive, I will often tell a client, this is great, just wait two years so that you can have some sense of assurity that you're out of the idealization stage and you're having a relationship with the person you are really seeing oh, that's interesting. before you move into kind of a contractual place. And you still might yeah. do that, but you need, the brain actually needs time. Yeah, it's like, I, you know, I remember reading this now, there was some, there's some research about like brain chemistry, right? That it actually takes a while for your brain chemistry to shift out to, of, mm-hmm. you know, Well, exactly. All of that dopamine and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. flowing around. Mm -hmm. And the last research I would very much recommend to people is a book called The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. It's a little book. It's been around for a very long time, but it's beautifully laid out. You can read it in a weekend. And his idea is that a true sense of loving a partner comes from uh, psychological maturity. Mm -hmm. And, And he unpacks that in a way that's very knowable. And I think we're all in our own uh, spontaneous way pointing to this idea Mm -hmm. of being awake and informed, knowing yourself, having the time to know the other person in a deep way Mm -hmm. 
and that willpower and choice and the maturity to have enough willpower mm -hmm. to persevere in the idea of the marriage are all part of being psychologically awake. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are basically in accord. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> on that note, let's move on to a dream. So uh, we are going to take a, be taking a look at a dream that one of our listeners sent to us. The dreamer uh, is a woman who is in her late 40s. And uh, let's see, it says that she is a musician and a mother. And okay, I'll just read the dream. And we will also put the dream in the show notes as per usual. So here we go. I was in my parents' house. My mother was showing me some renovations she had done in the bathroom. This bathroom doesn't exist in her real house. Suddenly in the mirror, I saw myself behind me charging towards me. I turned around in terror, but there was nobody there. I turned back to the mirror and saw myself again, looking pretty demented, charging towards me. Again, I turned around, but there was nobody there. Hmm. This dream reminds me of one of the things that Jung said, uh, that when he uh, hears a dream for the first time, the first thought that he has is, I have no idea what this <laughs> dream means. <laughs> so that has happened to me many, many a time, yep. and, and here it is again. It's not a bad place to, to start, uh, is it? It's like beginner's mind. Well, but, when I don't know where to start, I start in the beginning, and I see too. that we, the dream starts, I was in my, my parents', parents house. house. So what we know is we are in the parental complex. Yes. But there are some renovations being made to that. So we might imagine that the mother in the dream perhaps is an outpicturing of the mother complex, her internalized mother. And is a bathroom. Mm -hmm. so, so what we mean by uh, the parental complex, mm -hmm. just um, sometimes we'll fall into a bit of specialized language, is that Jung had an idea that there is a way that the psychological life organizes that we will collect memories that have a similarity of emotional tone and a similarity of images and we will group them together inside of the psyche held at a center point by an archetypal core or an organizing pattern so there is a kind of universal feeling and perception of parenthood and parents and inside of your psyche, all of the memories of parents uh, relate to each other around that center. And the dominant emotional tone of those memories holds a huge amount of charge. So when this complex or this collection of energy moves very close to the dreamer or close to the waking mind, it can create very strong feelings, thoughts, and even behaviors that will recede as the complex moves back towards the unconscious or can get really potent when it's right next to the dreamer. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of sort of what that might look like in someone's life, you know, a parental complex, I mean, there's a lot about how we grew up and how we related to our parents that might have an impact on how we feel about ourselves in our career, where we get stuck in friendships, maybe how we are with our own children, uh, what it's like for us to be in relationship with a partner. Yes. So it can obviously affect you in lots of different ways that would have a pattern, yes. as Joseph was mm -hmm. saying. And, and mother and father are slightly different mm -hmm. uh, in feeling, tone, and memory. But these are the parental complexes are, are templates for relationship. That's how mm -hmm. we learn what a relationship yeah. looks like, feels like, and is. Even if when we grow up, we consciously say, well, I I'm not going to be like my mother in this way, or I'm not going to do what my father always did. Uh, it is still there as a deeply ingrained emotional memories, patterns, syndromes. And they're often working below the surface. So in our waking life, we may feel pressed into certain attitudes or behaviors, and we don't really know why, or it just feels normal. And the gift of looking at your dreams is that it's really demonstrated to you like a little play or a movie 
where now we're looking at the image of the mother or looking at dynamics of the parent in a way that's being played out right in front of you. So the possibility of really catching a glimpse of what this stuff is doing below the surface is just really accessible. Yes. So, so I think it's significant that the mother is making some renovations. Yes. Because one of the things that can happen, you know, over the course of a lifetime and can be assisted by analysis is that those patterns of relationship that got put in place through our relationship with our mother or father can alter. They, we can change them. And I think that maybe that's what the renovations are. Deb, what are you thinking about the bathroom? I agree with you about it's uh, hopeful and interesting that renovations are taking place inside in the place of the mother complex. And what is a bathroom? I st often start there. What's a bathroom? Mm -hmm. Just as we know what bathrooms are. Bathrooms have sinks, toilets, tubs, showers. What do we do in a bathroom? Although I, I would say that if I were working with a streamer, I'd be very curious about what this bathroom looked like and yes. what the renovations were. Yes, and that's a, a limitation that we have in this particular format that we're working in, mm -hmm. is we don't know what a bathroom is to this dreamer mm -hmm. that may have particular individual mm -hmm. associations and memories. However, um, it's a place of primal functions. It's a place of beautification, putting on cosmetics, doing your hair taking a luxurious shower, a very personal space, unlike, let intimate. us say, the kitchen or the living room that is often shared with other people. One is usually in a bathroom doing something very individual, personal, and private. Okay, and then we have the this mirror. This mirror winds up being really important wow. in the dream. Yes, this uh, capacity for reflection. Yes. And that... One, the dream figure, the dream ego, is interested in looking into the reflecting substance and then upon this self-reflection discover something really shocking, yes. surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the mirror or the ability for self-reflection sort of speaks to our willingness and ability to have a relationship with ourselves. Yes. And this, one of the terms we'll use is the observing ego, this capacity to self-observe, which is actually such a relief. It creates this distance between what we see and how we react to it. It slows that down so that we can think about what we're able to see. Mm -hmm. So what comes up around the feeling tone of when the dream ego... The, the I in the dream, sees herself in the mirror. Here are the words. I saw myself charging toward me. I turned around in terror. I turned back to the mirror and saw myself again looking pretty demented, charging again toward me. So uh, there is real energy here of this word charging used twice. Mm -hmm of a charging energy from the unconscious that the dream ego, the I part, is scared by, disconcerted. Yes, it evokes, the word charging evokes something very wild and primal, because yes. I think we use that often, like animals will charge. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an, inst yes. it's an yes. instinct that humans, you know, can't primal control. Primal aggression. Primal aggression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would be so curious as to what that meant for the dreamer mm -hmm. of tell me more and what is coming toward you in this way that you were previously unaware of. Mm -hmm. uh, some really powerful energy is charging towards you. And uh, we, we perceive charging as an attack, uh, taking your point, Joseph, about an animal comes charging toward us, of course we're scared. But this is a great dream to illust illustrate how different the perspective of the dream ego might be from the perspective of the yes. other parts. So, you know, one one place to start doesn't, this is not always true, but it's sort of a good, uh, you know, rule of thumb to start with, is the least trustworthy attitude in the dream is that of the dream ego. Mm. The dream ego is terrified of this other self. But what I would want to do with this dreamer is I might ask her to 
drop down, re-enter the dream, and experience it through the eyes of the self that is charging. Mm -hmm. Because what I hear is that some part of her wants to get her attention. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it might look very threatening, but if we see it through the eyes of that part, it's like, well, there's something urgent here that you need mm -hmm. to know and pay attention to. Yes, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. about stages of life and the second stage of life uh, that Jung uh, really pioneered comes along in midlife in the 40s or 50s, depending on the person, where life becomes more introverted and uh, energy from a deeper part of ourself is often more accessible, demands to be encountered, demands to mm -hmm. be known. And here's, so for our submission form, which by the way, you can find on our website if you want to submit a dream. But we, we have this question, you know, just tell us any significant context that we might need to know. What's kind of going, what's your life situation at the time that you have the dream? And here's what this streamer wrote. She says, I can't think of anything hugely significant, but I have a few things that I've been procrastinating about for a long time. And I'm feeling a little bit stuck as to what my next step should be in order to get them done. So that's such a, <laughs> we could imagine the charging force as being that agency, that that power to perhaps move through the procrastination. Right, that's, that's been, that she hasn't been able to be in relationship with. Yes. But if she could get into relationship with it, then that mm -hmm. logjam might resolve. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's, but we have to imagine that whatever that thing is that, that charging part of herself wants her to know is something she's not consciously aware of now. And therefore is disrupts her sense of self when she encounters it in the dream. It's hard for her to imagine that it's her, except the dream maker is masking it in her face. Right. So yes. just make yeah. sure you get right. the message. Right. This, this is, is you. you. So here's you know? here's one thing I might imagine. I'm making this up, right? I'm just fabricating this but it might be that the things that she's been needing to attend to are to i don't know get her professional license renewed let's say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just make this up but perhaps deep down she's unhappy in that career and it's time for a change mm -hmm. and that's why she she's been procrastinating and hasn't been able to move forward so then it would be like the content in the dream that's trying to get her attention is maybe this really important thing, like it's time to look at whether or not this is really what you even want to do. So I, I, I think I'm lifting that up because I want to say, be prepared to be surprised by what you learn from your dreams. That's a, that mm. is a wonderful truth. I'd like to also introduce another um, really fun area of dream analysis that sometimes the dream maker in us is tricky, is humorous, loves to use double entendres, and it can be really interesting to step outside of the script of the dream and just look at this phrase, this image of myself was charging me. So another meaning of the word charge is to actually keep sending you bills or invoices. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun idea to think that this hidden part of your psyche, you keep racking up a bill mm -hmm. with them yeah. and they keep wanting you to pay the bill um, in Char some Charging fashion. can also be um, like to be charged with a responsibility. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. charging you with yeah. getting off your tail <laughs> and getting your yeah. stuff done, absolutely. And even the issue of charging, I mean, is your shadow figure running around with a credit card yeah. constantly <laughs> charging things and, yeah. and i've seen this happen well i'll bring that up and then a client will say oh my god i'm a total compulsive spender <laughs> you know yeah. and that the dream just slipped it in incredibly yeah. Yeah. surreptitiously and almost kind of tricked us into talking about it so that kind of really creative re-angling around the dream mm -hmm. can bring up stuff that's sometimes really important yep you've been listening to this jungian life from our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.